please join me in welcoming Mayor Cruz and Mr. Ca uh, Mayor Castro and Mr. Cruz. <laughs> Maybe you'd like to be Mayor Cruz. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Mayor, Mr. Cruz, you both had uh, quite a summer. Uh, Mayor Castro, let me ask you first to reflect on this summer. You were out in the national spotlight for a few weeks. What did you learn about yourself, and what did you learn about the state of politics in this country? Um, well, first of all, uh, congratulations on a great event. Thank Let's you. give Evan a big round of applause. This is a great <laughs> Texas Tribune Festival. It's getting bigger and better every year. Thank you. Uh, no, thanks for the question, and it's great to be here uh, with, with uh, Mr. Cruz. Um, what did I learn about myself? Hmm. Um, well, uh, I learned that uh, I didn't panic uh, when I realized that I had you know, all the networks and about 19,000 people watching all at one time, because yeah. uh, it was like throwing a claustrophobic into the closet and then taking away the key. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think what we've seen in this 2012 cycle is some, some of what we saw in, in 2010, um, that people are both aspirational, they're hopeful, they're also frustrated. Um, you know, people are still committed to the fundamental ideals yep. that make the United States special, that make it a land of opportunity, that make it, uh, you know, I believe, the greatest country in the world. At the same time, you know, they're nervous. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's one of the things that's been very clear this whole campaign season. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it has been an exciting summer. I also learned that uh, my daughter knows how to flip her hair. She does. <laughs> <laughs> Most famous child in America, at least for a little while. And you know, uh, uh, the nation learned that you have a twin brother. That's right. I thought, I thought the best moment was Jon Stewart saying when, uh, uh, of, of you, uh, and then they showed a picture of your brother. They said, the Democrats love Julian Castro so much they have an extra one in case he breaks. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. I thought that was actually right. a high point of the coverage. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Cruz, you obviously had quite a whirlwind summer. It was really a whirlwind year, and you had your own moment in the sun at the Republican convention. What did you learn about yourself, and what did you see and learn about the state of politics in this country? Well, at the convention, I'll tell you, I was just glad that I didn't fall off the stage. <laughs> uh, it, it was when I came out, the plan had been that there was going to be a two-minute video between the prior speaker and me, and as happens at these conventions, they were running a bit late. Uh, and so they said, they put, called an audible at the end, and they said, all right, we're going to cancel the video. So as soon as the prior speaker stops, you head right on out. Right. So instead of just a clean stage, you had the podium and teleprompter going down, and there was literally a 15-foot pit about a <laughs> foot behind me. So, so the clearest thought I had at the convention was, I really hope I don't do a backflip. Right. Don't this. die. Right. Yeah. Could have gone badly. Uh, did, were you surprised at the convention by anything you heard or, or, or saw? P people you talked to about their views of the country? You, you've been pretty clear about your own views of things uh, yourself, but what, what did you hear? I, I thought the convention was fantastic. I thought there was an energy on the ground. Yeah. And, and in terms of what I've learned and experienced the last year and a half, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it truly has been a dizzying journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and. and the biggest thing, I think, in terms of our primary was, was it was really a testament to the grassroots. Uh, in, in any other cycle, what happened in the Republican primary for Senate couldn't have happened. Uh, in, in any ordinary year, this should have been a very easy lay down. We were outspent three to one. I mean, as you know, when we started, I was at 2%. Right. Uh, and in fact, had the primary been back in March as opposed to May, Mr. Cruz, you might not be sitting here. Uh, thank God for small miracles. Right. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Cruz, let's get right into it. You uh, published an, an opinion piece in the Washington Times uh, this week that said, not for the first time have you said this, but you said it very directly, America is at a crisis point. Can you explain what you mean by that, please? I think we're at a fiscal and economic cliff. I think we have pursued government spending programs that have created a debt that is out of control. Uh, you know, at the convention, I. After talking, I went home to our hotel room and, and about 1.30 in the morning was looking on my iPhone at Twitter. And, and the comedian Paula Poundstone had, had sent a, a tweet that evening. I, I don't know her, but she was apparently watching the coverage and, and she said, Ted Cruz just said, when his daughter was born, the national debt was $10 trillion. Now it's $16 trillion. What the heck did she do? <laughs> Blame it on your daughter, Well. 
So you think that the debt, first and foremost, is the issue that's putting the nation in crisis? I think the debt tied together with government spending, which is yeah. causing the debt, and tied together with government power. I think we've seen a vast expansion in the power of the federal government. Right. And I think it is crippling small businesses and destroying job creation. Mayor Castro, as I said, you were a national co-chair of the Obama-Biden campaign. You want to respond on behalf of the campaign or on your own behalf to the charge that somehow we're a nation in crisis? Well, I would say that I would put the challenge that we have as a nation in a different context uh, and say that to the extent that, that uh, we're a nation that is in quote unquote crisis, although I wouldn't describe it as that, uh, because I believe that fundamentally that we can overcome this uh, and that we can do it in a fairly rational, rational, reasonable way. I'd say the challenge is that we've now had uh, more than a generation of folks who are not willing to ask Americans to sacrifice and to be realistic uh, about how we take on our biggest challenges. So. Uh, for instance, uh, everyone remembers the Republican debate where they asked folks whether you would take the bargain of, of uh, $1 worth of tax increases for $10 worth of uh, basically tax cuts, uh, and everybody raised their hand saying they wouldn't accept that. Uh, we've become a country where, and I'd say you know, it's not just one side, both sides, but I think principally more one side now than ever. Uh, is not willing to be realistic about how we can tackle these challenges. Um, so if there's a crisis that I see in the United States for the long term, it's not the temporal issue of how we're going to deal with money, because I'm very confident that we're going to be able to deal with that. Uh, it's how are we going to bring back our, our, our sense of, of what we can accomplish together as Americans uh, when um, we're realistic about those challenges. That's the, that's the thing that when I think about mm -hmm. the word crisis for the country, yep. that's the thing that worries me more. Mr. Cruz, do you believe we have a problem with not asking people to sacrifice? Mayor Castro is not the first person to suggest that. You know, we were, for 10 years or more, we've heard that the government is not asking all of us to do enough to help get the country back on its feet. Well, it, it, it's interesting. The word sacrifice, um, I, I have to say, when, when I hear any politicians talk about sacrifice, that usually means grab your wallets. Uh, it usually means increasing taxes. And, and I will give President Obama credit. Uh, he is the first presidential candidate since Walter Mondale to run for president explicitly on a platform of, I will raise your taxes. Well, he's not saying he'll raise everybody's taxes, Mr. Cruz. He's saying he'll raise the taxes on the wealthy. Well, although actually what he told the U.S. Supreme Court is that he already has raised everybody's taxes because his Justice Department told the Supreme Court that Obamacare was a tax on every American. And that was the position of the United States under Obama. And that was the basis on which the Supreme Court upheld Obamacare is that it was a tax increase on every to, American. To, to Mayor Castro's point, though, what Mayor Castro is, I'm going to say, implying, because he didn't come out and say it directly, is that the people who in, in this country who have more might be asked to sacrifice. That's obviously what the president has been on the campaign trail saying. You do not agree with that. I do not agree with that. And let me say two things. Number one, if you look historically, government spending in modern times has historically been roughly 20% of GDP. Federal tax revenue has been roughly 18% of GDP. I don't think the problem is we're taxed too little. I think the problem is we are spending too much. In the last three years, federal government spending has gone from 20% of GDP to 25% of GDP. That is a fundamental structural shift. And it has produced record-setting deficits. And it's putting us on a path right. to where Greece and Italy and much of Europe are. Number two, I think particularly when the economy is teetering on the edge of recession, the worst thing you can do is jack up taxes on small businesses, on entrepreneurs, on job creators. I think that is makes it all the more likely to push us into a recession and for the 23 million people who are struggling for work, the worst thing to do is hurt the small businesses that create two-thirds of all well, the jobs. And I would just say, I mean, you know, uh, it's clear that the president has uh, reduced taxes. You know, he's reduced taxes for small businesses 18 times. You know, he's cut taxes for 95% of families out there. The issue is, do we ask everybody to sacrifice? And as you know, when you look at the marginal rates in the United States, 
when Ronald Reagan took office, the marginal rates were about 71, 72 percent, right? So it's very interesting to me that the greatness that people speak of in terms of the United States, when we talk about the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, uh, you know, the marginal rates that folks paid were much greater. Now, nobody's saying that we're going to go back to that. At the same time, during the Clinton years, we had marginal rates that were a little bit higher than they are now. And we had some of the, the best economic times that the country has ever seen. So that's what I'm talking about. It, you know, we have to, my concern for the country is that all of this heat has been generated around this issue instead of light and analysis and, and, and a sober look at the role that every American can play, should play, in strengthening our country. That's the concern that I have in the long run. I want to pick up Mr. Cruz's suggestion that the economy is in trouble and try to bring it directly home to San Antonio, Mr. Mr. Mayor. You know, Texas has endured, we hear from Governor Perry and others, Texas has endured this recession sure. better than most other states. But in San Antonio specifically, it's been a, a tough couple of years. Uh, there was a Census Bureau report that came out this week that led to a story in the San Antonio Express News from which I have these numbers. According to the Census Bureau, between 2009 and 2011, unemployment in San Antonio went up by more than a full point. Median household income dropped by $2,000, and the percentage of citizens on food stamps rose more than four percentage points. You know how tough the economy is. You're leading a city that has uh, been bearing some of that brunt. Sure. Can you talk about that? Do you dispute the idea that somehow the economy right now is in a world of hurt? Whoever's responsibility you think that well, is? Well, I would say, I think every American would say that the economy is not where we want it to be. But if you look nationally, there's also no question that we've now had 30 months of private sector job growth, you know, 4.6 million new jobs that have been created during that time. Yep. At the same time, if we were to take literally, you know, if we were to go right now to the archives of, of the university and, and pull out the front page headlines from four years ago and look at what was happening at this point four years ago, where we're losing hundreds of thousands of jobs. In the month when President Obama took office, we lost almost 800,000 jobs that month. People remember the severe anxiety and the talk of another depression during that time. So whether we're talking about the state of Texas or San Antonio or any place, are we where we want to be? No. But are we better off than we were uh, when we were talking about going into another depression and the banks collapsing and so on and so forth? Oh, absolutely. There's no question in my mind. Mr. Cruz, this question, the famous Ronald Reagan construction, are you better off than you were four years ago, has become part of this campaign, naturally. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Mayor Castro makes a case that at least seems not to be in dispute factually. There has been 30 months of co uh, consecutive months of job growth. And when the president came into office, things were significantly worse than they are now. Mayor Castro's point is, are they as good as they should be? No. But are they better than they were then? Yes. Would, would you like to take issue with that? Well, right now, tragically, workforce participation is at the lowest rate it's been in 30 years. Uh, you know, you mentioned John Stewart. I think often you can get a barometer on where the country is uh, by the late night comics. And, and, and there was an interesting joke Jay Leno told the other day when the unemployment. I thought you said comics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I, I, I'm not even going to get in the midst no, of right. that. Um, uh, you know, but, but, you know, but Evan, uh, but, you know, Letterman is getting older and, and, and they, they will have a vacant chair at some point. So what did Jay Leno say? So Leno was observing when the unemployment numbers came out yeah. that they went from 8.3 to 8.1 percent. And the reason was that 368,000 people dropped out of the workforce entirely, stopped looking for work, right. which is the only reason the numbers went down, because ne nearly 4, 400,000 people gave up hope they could find work, and Leno observed. So Obama now has his strategy for re-election, which is encouraging even more people to stop looking, looking for, for work. work. But Mr. Cruz, the question was not, is the unemployment rate today 8.1 or 8.3? It's, is the unemployment rate today and is job creation today better than it was when the president took office? And the answer is absolutely not. When you've got the lowest rate of workforce participation in 30 years, that's unambiguous. Let me tell you, I think, the most important economic okay. number for assessing where we are, and it yes. is 1.5. In the three and a half years of President Obama's tenure, GDP growth has been 1.5 percent. Historically, for the last 70 years, GDP growth has been 3.3 percent. So we have had nearly four years of growth less than half the historical average. By contrast, in 1984, 
under Ronald Reagan, GDP growth was 7.2%. Now, what does that mean? I mean, these are abstract numbers. What does right. it mean when the economy is growing, when small businesses are prospering, they're creating new jobs, people are able to find work, it, it creates opportunity for everyone. What we have, unfortunately, is small business after small business is facing crushing uh, uncertainty. I'll, I'll tell you, the single biggest question you hear from, from business leaders is they don't know between Obamacare and Dodd-Frank, between the offshore drilling moratorium in Texas. All of these policies are killing jobs. Right. And, and what, what entrepreneurs express to me all over the state is this sense of great uncertainty. What are the federal regulators going to do? And the president keeps promising to raise everyone's taxes, which is, which is causing small businesses to, to keep capital on the sidelines and not deploy it because they've got so much uncertainty. Well, again, I'm not sure the president's promising to promise, raise everyone's taxes. But my question is, do you know what the GDP growth was in the last year of the Bush administration? I don't. I don't either, but I will look that up. <laughs> well, but, but let me say, I, ho I hope you had an answer. But more right? to the point, more to yeah. the point of it. I mean, yeah. let's compare compare job growth under President Obama during these 30 months, and, and under Bush. I mean, the 4.6 million new private sector jobs that have been created under this president is already more than were created uh, under George Bush. I mean, you have a president here who basically inherited one of the worst economies that this country has ever seen. And of course, what are you gonna do with a falling object, right? That object is gonna fall, then you're gonna to have to pick it up, and the rise back up is gonna be a little bit slower. What you've seen now is that in these 30 months, 4.6 million new jobs, he's already created more jobs than George W. Bush. I mean, this is a president that understands how to get the economy going. It's not where we wanna be, but this election really should be about, okay, between these two candidates, who actually has a plan for the future? Because elections are always about the future. Uh, and you know, given his record, uh, I have more confidence that President Obama can get that done than that Governor Romney can. Mr. May, I want to get into some specific issues, uh, beginning with education. You know, right now, you are working to pass a, an eighth of a cent sales tax increase in San Antonio to pay for pre-kindergarten, pre-K. Uh, there are people who say, it's not really the business of the city of San Antonio to be raising people's taxes, even if the voters of San Antonio decide themselves they want to do this, to pay for pre-K. Can you defend, uh, uh, sitting next to somebody who does not like taxes, famously, the decision to go out to market with a tax increase, even for something that you so strongly uh, believe in? Uh, many former mayors of San Antonio are with you, but there are also elected officials of San Antonio who are, who are not with you. So this is a matter of some debate. Yeah, I mean, this is where I'm coming from. Basically, I, I fundamentally believe that brain power is the currency of success in the 21st century global economy. That, that those communities that create it will be the communities that thrive in our market economy. And those communities that do not are gonna be the ones that fall behind. So San Antonio, uh, I believe, needs to make a huge investment in education. Now that investment is not limited to more money. It also means getting parents involved. It also means expecting more from everybody along the, the whole education ecosystem from administrators to policymakers to teachers, expecting more out of everyone. Uh, so what I have on the table in San Antonio is basically uh, a one-eighth cent sales tax increase that would generate $31 million a year that would cost the median household in the city $7.81 per year. Now mind, mind you, every day in Texas, it costs $359.81 to keep a juvenile incarcerated. Uh, so uh, you know, what we have on the table is the opportunity to educate more than 22,400 four-year-olds with high-quality pre-K, fill a gap that exists right now in terms of who's getting high-quality full-day pre-K, uh, and we're asking the voters to consider the merits. About seven bucks you, a year. You see, I don't believe that taxes are inherently evil. I believe that just like that will be of, that will be tweeted <laughs> by the way i don't like give them a second yeah <laughs> hashtag tribune fest go ahead all right i don't yeah. let me say that again yeah. you know i don't believe that taxes are inherently evil i don't like them nobody likes them but i've told the voters of san antonio there is no way to sugarcoat this i am asking you for this tax increase and more than that i believe in you i believe that that if we put it in front of you that you can make a decision as to whether or not you want to make this investment. 
So are you willing to pay $7.81 if we meet you halfway by ensuring accountability, uh, ensuring that we require parents to be involved in their child's education because they, they're you know, probably the most important shepherd of what happens in a child's life. Uh, we require uh, performance audits, and we set this with a definitive time frame of eight years. And in eight years, you get to vote on this again. You can either keep it or leave it based on how it's performed. Right. And we set actual goals to make it transparent. Um, so what we're gonna have to decide in Texas, especially on the issue of education, because brain power is so important to economic success in the future, is are we willing to make the investment? And if we do, then I also believe that we have a right to expect more from everybody in the education ecosystem, from parents to policymakers to administrators, everybody down the line. Now, Mr. Cruz, Republicans, I know many Republicans like the idea of local control. Sounds like what Mayor Castro is doing is saying to the local community, you control this. If you want money for pre-K, you can vote to support or vote to reject, if you prefer to, an increase in taxes. You have an issue with that? Uh, Evan, I agree with you. I, I commend Mayor Castro for taking a leadership on, on, on issue, an issue that he is passionate about and for taking it to the voters of San Antonio. And, and I think that's where the important issues of education should be decided, or is at the state level and at the local level. You would vote no, however, for I, a I tax might, Well, increase. actually, if, if I were a citizen of San Antonio, I'd, I'd, look at, I'd listen to the merits of the argument. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, there's certainly a role for taxes. I think there, there are essential services government provides. And I think that is a choice for the citizens of San Antonio to make. Do, do the, on the merits, does it make sense for them? And the great thing about it is, if San Antonio, if the, if the voters of San Antonio decide they want to do this, and it works, then you can then look okay. at the results yeah. and other communities can make the decisions. One of the reasons I don't like federal decisions that are forced from Washington all across the country is different communities have different needs. And, and what might be a good policy in San Antonio right. might be a terrible policy in Laredo or Detroit or New York City. The mayor says he doesn't believe taxes are inherently evil, but with qualifications. Do you believe taxes are inherently evil, Mr. Cruz? Oh, evil is a strong word. It is. <laughs> and that's the word I'm asking you to use. Do you, think, <laughs> do, do you think taxes are inherently evil or don't you? I think taxes are morally neutral. I think what morally neutral does with them yeah. can be good or bad. OK. Let me move on to health care, Mr. Cruz. <laughs> I tried. Um, Mr. Cruz, uh, this week, the Census Bureau uh, that I alluded to earlier, their report also talked about the state of health care in this country. Uh, Census Bureau said that Texas now has 5.8 million uninsured citizens. That's down as a percentage of, over, of our overall population a little bit. Now it's 23% of our overall population is uninsured. We are still the state with more uninsured citizens on a percentage basis than any in the country. Along with that, a report by Steve Murdoch and Michael Klein of the Hobby Center at Rice came out and said that if only we would embrace federal health care reform, we could insure 3 million Texans by 2014. In a state with the most citizens uninsured in the country, Mr. Cruz, why would we not try something that at least some people believe would insure more than 3 million of our fellow citizens? Well, I think, you know, right now, the nation is struggling with Obamacare and what's going to happen if Obamagare gets fully implemented. And I, and I think that's one of the central issues at stake in November. It's one of the central issues at stake in the presidential race, right. and it's one of the central issues at stake in the congressional and Senate race. Well, in the Trump. Senate race, the fact is you're a vote to repeal. I, not... I am an enthusiastic vote to repeal. Okay. Uh, and if you look at what, what is happening with Obamacare already, you are seeing uh, small businesses, you're seeing employers drop health insurance, talk about dropping health insurance as Obamacare gets implemented. And, and Obamacare, if fully implemented, I believe, will lead inexorably towards shifting more and more of the citizenry to government-provided insurance, to moving us towards a single-payer system. And it's interesting. A lot of the liberal activist group got very angry with, with President Obama that he didn't go all the way to a single-payer socialized health care immediately. And, and there were reassurances made, fear not. We'll get there. I think that's what Obamacare is headed towards, if it, if it is fully implemented. And I think if you look at every nation on Earth that has implemented socialized health care, that has put government-run health care, you have seen poor quality. You've seen right. rationing. You've seen waiting lines. 
I don't think that's what Americans want. And I also think Obamacare was implemented with, with, with a government arrogance that was extraordinary. There has been no major social legislation passed in modern times other than Obamacare that was on a pure party line vote rammed down the throat both of the opposition and also of the American people. Mr. Cruz, so you're going to double down on the idea that the Affordable Care Act, which I do believe now has been found constitutional, uh, is socialized medicine. You're, you're doubling down on that. I, I think it is designed to lead us inexorably towards socialized medicine. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I'm, I'm just guessing you have a different point of view on this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do. Um, I mean, let, let's just take a look at, at what the facts are. Um, yeah, it's been fascinating to hear the discussion about Obamacare over these last couple of years. And, and every time you hear it, it's always anecdote after anecdote, sort of fear after fear about what's going to happen, about what people are talking, you know, snippets of conversations here and there. You started with a very good fact, Evan, which is that the percentage of folks who actually have health care, not just in Texas, but over in the United States over these last couple of, over this last year, has, has gone up for the first time in a very long time. And the reason that it's gone up is because now, you know, folks who are up to 26 years old can stay on their parents' plan. You know, pre-existing conditions are not some paperwork excuse for an insurance company to deny you uh, benefits that you've earned and paid for. Uh, so the only things that we have out of Obamacare uh, are a positive so far Everything else that we've talked about, about, well, are small business owners, are they worried about it, or, 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 or is there a chilling effect that's happening because of it? There is no empirical evidence for that. It's all about some future that's out there that's painted very darkly. Although I will say that we do have a model to look at, and it's Massachusetts. It's Romney Care. And what we saw in Romney Care, with I wouldn't Romney vote for Care, that either. Well, but what we saw in Massachusetts with Romney Care is that actually Massachusetts folks like it, that it's worked well, uh, and it would be a great thing if if the governor would actually embrace what he accomplished. Because I, you know, I would agree with him that that was a, a good way for Massachusetts to go. And you know what? In 2015, 2016, 2017, by the time if if. Uh, uh, Mr. Cruz is, is elected this year. He's up for re-election in 2018. I bet that folks are going to be singing a different tune about Obamacare. Uh, Mr. Cruz, to the specific points that the mayor made about uh, pre-existing conditions and allowing uh, uh, young people to remain for a certain period of time on their parents' health insurance, uh, even Governor Romney, who you support for president in this election, uh, has said he would keep some of those things in any health care plan that he would put forward. Uh, if you were elected president. Are you okay with pre-existing conditions? Are you okay with the keeping people on their health parents insurance through 26? Are there aspects of it that you would permit even if you want to repeal the entire thing? No. Uh, so you're, you're against pe pe people uh, being able to get insurance despite pre-existing conditions. Let me get you on the record here. No, and, then, and, and let me explain. Look, political candidates and politicians love to come with goodies and say, we're going to give you something and isn't this great. And they never focused on the, focus on the cost. Uh, you know, my view of, of how to approach health care reform, and this is, this is a complicated issue, it, it doesn't, doesn't admit to sort of simple Band-Aid solutions, is fundamentally different from the approach of President Obama's. I think health care reform should expand markets, expand competition, and empower consumers and patients, and disempower government bureaucrats from second-guessing the decisions that are made between a patient and a doctor. Now, what does that mean specifically? The three reforms I think would be most important would be, number one, allowing people to purchase health insurance across state lines. Why is that? Because that would create a true 50-state national market for low-cost, catastrophic health care. Part of the problem, every time politicians say, every health plan must include the following bells and whistles, and they give away all this stuff, it has the inevitable effect of driving up the cost of health insurance for everybody. And one of the biggest reasons so many people in Texas and nationally don't have health insurance is because it's so expensive. If we had a true 50-state national marketplace with low-cost catastrophic care, that would expand access dramatically. So buying, buying across state lines is number one. What are two and three? Number two is expanding the use of health savings accounts so people can save in a tax-deferred way 
to take care of their health needs, and I think that has significant impacts, both in terms of empowering consumers, but also in terms of constraining costs in the system. Right, so that's two. Two. Come and, back here. and then three, three is working to de-link health insurance from employment. It is an historical accident that most of us get our insurance from our job. It actually arose during wage and price controls in World War II as a way for employers to attract employees. And the problem is, we don't live in the 1940s and the 1950s where people go and work for one company for 50 years anymore. The average American stays four years at a single employer. Right. And if you or I lose our jobs, right. we don't lose our life insurance, our home insurance, our car insurance. So portability is a concern. For you. Portability, and, and if insurance is right. personal, and you own it, and it travels with you regardless of your job, right. that goes a long way to solving the problem of pre-existing conditions because right. you're not losing your health care between one job and the I want the mayor to respond, but, I, but Mayor, I, I, Mr. Cruz, I asked you two specific questions, and I want you to answer those questions. Do you support uh, allowing people to buy insurance despite pre-existing conditions? Do you support the principle of allowing young people to stay on their parents' health insurance up until age 26 or some fixed date? All right, let, let's answer those one at a time. Yeah. Uh, let, let's start with age 26. Look, if you mandate every insurance policy must allow young people to, to stay on their parents' plan up to 26, that will increase the cost of insurance coverage for everyone. Which you don't want to see happen. Which I, because so it I will, take that as a no. Uh, you, you, but it, it is a no as a government mandate, but if, if you allow people to buy insurance across state lines in the marketplace, some insurance policies will be available that say, if you want to buy this policy and cover your kids right. up to 26, you can do so and you can pay higher premiums. What I don't want to do is jack up everyone's premiums be because these things aren't free. So, if you man mandate, so man it, mandate no, but possibility of that happening organically, yes. Absolutely. What about pre-existing? Pre-existing conditions, if someone has a policy, if they're personal and portable, then insurance companies shouldn't dump you when you get sick. But if you have a mandate that you must be covered regardless of a pre-existing condition, that's not insurance. So if I don't have insurance, but I go to get insurance, and the insurance company wants to deny me because I have a pre-existing condition, your point of view is they should be able to. Let, let, yes, and let me give you a, a reason why. Let's suppose we were talking about home insurance, and we were saying you should not care about a pre-existing condition. What is the incentive then? No one should buy fire insurance on their home. Wait till your home burns down, and then go get then fire go insurance. Buy insurance. And it's the reason why Obamacare includes the individual mandate. Because you cannot have a requirement that everyone must be covered regardless of pre-existing condition unless you have an individual mandate that forces everyone against their will to purchase insurance. And, and I, th I disagree with the individual mandate. Most Texans disagree with the individual mandate. And those two are intertwined. You can't have the goodies without the cost. Mayor, quickly respond to that. Well, yeah, I mean, I just have a different view of it. You know, I, I have a different perspective on it. Um, you know, in fact, the underlying perspective seems to be uh, that everybody is going to go their own way, and when everybody goes their own way, that you know things will sort of work out. I think, especially with something like health care, that we need to be more intentional than that. Uh, but just to take an example, one of the things that you mentioned is is this idea of folks getting low-cost, catastrophic insurance, right? So you know, just so everybody gets that for a second, catastrophic coverage. Right? You have some. You know, huge health event in your life that's going to be very expensive and you're able to get insurance so that it won't be quite as expensive. But if you look at the reality in, for instance, in the Hispanic community, in our community, uh, of how many folks have diabetes, how many folks live with hypertension, with, with all of the ailments that are associated with diabetes, and year after year after year it's getting worse. And we have so many folks who literally are using the emergency room as their primary care physician. So they have the catastrophe. They end up in the emergency room because they go into diabetic shock or they have to get an amputation, uh, you know, like my grandmother eventually did. I don't want for us to wait as a state or a nation to work with folks until they have that catastrophe health-wise just because you know, an insurance company says that they had a pre-existing condition. I want them to be able to get health care. And more than that, we can make it workable, economically workable, as the president has, so that they can get that health care. So you know, just on that point, you know, we don't want to wait until somebody has a health catastrophe to say, well, now, now instead of 
you know, $25,000, it's going to be $5,000. No, we want, uh, you know, to, in to help ensure, right, that folks can get good health care coverage throughout their lives so that they don't end up in that emergency room, in that health catastrophe, so that they can actually be preventative, not just experience the catastrophe. That's what we ought to aim for as a nation, not the other. Uh, we have about five minutes before I open it up to the audience for questions. I want to come to immigration. Uh, I want to ask each of I appreciated, by the way, that you said Mr. Cruz is Hispanic. Unlike the chairman of the state Democratic Party, you don't question whether that's legitimate. <laughs> yeah. um, we, but we have two uh, gentlemen up here who are both Hispanic. Uh, and I want to ask both of you, both as individuals and as members of the Hispanic community in Texas, what you believe the immigration policy of this country should be. It is a subject that has been kind of kicked down the road for the last couple of years. We're now only finally beginning to talk about it in earnest, despite uh, assurances that we would be having a real conversation about this. And I, I wonder if each of you, Mr. Cruz, first, uh, can you talk about where you think this country ought to go on this subject? Well, immigration is an issue that, that I think, sadly, neither party is serious about solving. I, I think you see both political parties demagoguing on the issue of immigration, using it to scare people. Uh, and I think the underlying policy is, is quite simple. I, I think most Texans, most Americans agree that number one, we need to get serious about securing our border. That we need to stop talking about it and actually solve the national security and law enforcement challenge of a border that is not secure. And number two, that we need to remain a nation that not just welcomes, but that celebrates legal immigrants. Americans by choice is what Ronald Reagan described, legal immigrants. I think one of our great strengths as a nation yep. is that all of us, our ancestors, came from all over the world seeking freedom and opportunity. And I think we need to remain a nation that celebrates legal immigrants and at the same time yep. secures our border and gets serious about stopping the problem. And of yet that same President Reagan in 1986 uh, uh, instituted a program that was effectively, if not literally, amnesty, which has been much criticized by members of your party, Mr. Cruz, for essentially opening the, the floodgates to people who uh, were not here legally. And you know that, that's, uh, Governor Perry last night said that he believed President Reagan would undo that if he were still here. I, I don't think amnesty is the right approach. I don't think most Texans or most Americans support amnesty. And, and I think amnesty is unfair to the millions of legal immigrants who wait years and sometimes decades in line to come here legally to reward those who broke the law, I think it's fundamentally unfair and it, it's not consistent with rule of law. Mayor Castro, we, we know that the president recently put into effect what we call prosecutorial discretion. This is a way to address the question of children of people who are here, uh, uh, undocumented persons who are in this country. Obviously, there have been some attempts of late to address some of the aspects of this, but overall, we do not have comprehensive immigration reform in this country, where should we go? Where should well, we go on this issue? You know, my hope is that after this election, uh, that the environment in DC will, will uh, be more supportive of comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, of course, we have different views on the subject. Uh, I, I agree with the President's decision to exercise prosecutor, prosecutorial discretion. Uh, I also agree with what he did for the Dreamers. Uh, and I hope that we're able to pass the DREAM Act in, in fairly short order. You're opposed uh, to the DREAM Act, Mr. Cruz. Yeah. Correct. Uh, but I would just say you know, that when you look at what's actually going on out there, I mean, the president is getting knocked on both sides, right? Some are knocking him because they say that he's deported more folks. You know, this administration, they say, has deported more folks than I don't know how many other well, then the Bush administration, I believe sure. his record on okay. deportations is, is uh, greater. We know that since 2004, the number of Border Patrol agents has doubled in our country, and that President Obama in his fiscal year 2012 budget called for an increase to over 21,000 Border Patrol agents. And that since 2007, the revenue going toward border security has actually increased 55%. And we also see, for instance, that in terms of Mexicans, coming to the United States, that that's at basically a net zero right now. So to suggest that somehow our borders are not secure, if, if, if what that means is that are they as secure as we would want them to be, well, we can always make them more secure, right? I mean, we could theoretically have zero people ever coming across the border. But the borders, I would argue, are about as or more secure than they ever have been 
before. I guess we could add our borders present. more secure than they were four years ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> might might, might actually couch it in those, yeah. in those terms. And, I, and, and, and so just, uh, and, then, and then there's this issue of, of the, the tone of the debate, and I think the fear-mongering in the debate. For instance, uh, this, this issue of folks who are OTMs, other than Mexicans, right? That I know that you and, uh, and uh, Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst talked about in the debate that y'all had. Uh, and, and one of the things that you mentioned was that there are many folks from Middle Eastern countries who are among the OTMs that come over to the United States. Do you know how many, how many, uh, OT, how many Middle Eastern country OTMs there, there were? I, I don't have that data now. Do you know that it's, it's less than 0.002% of the folks that came across? In fact, you know, it, it's so low that they could probably fit in this room. Now, should we be, we might suggest that one person is one too many, right? Which I agree with. At the same time, and that's why I said at the very beginning of our conversation, that there's a larger point here, that if we're in some sort of crisis as a nation, the crisis is not any temporal fiscal issue that we're facing or one policy issue. It's how are we going to address these, these issues in a reasonable way? And, and on both sides, I do agree with you, uh, Mr. Cruz, that on both sides, people have used this issue and others in terms of like piñata politics, right? I mean, they beat it about, you know, they, they, they um, turn these issues into cartoons. Uh, but on this issue of what it means for our country to have immigrants, to get immigrants that have been the building blocks of our nation. Uh, I really believe that we need to take a sober look at it. I hope we can get comprehensive immigration reform that is passed. Uh, I, I believe that the, the dreamers who are morally blameless ought to be allowed to stay here and to pursue their dreams of going to college or serving in the military or, or working or whatever. Um, I don't think that in the long run that the United States is going to be well served by being a nation that, you know, that sends a signal to the world that even though we're, we're, we're saying that you know, we like legal immigrants, we really, you know, we're comfortable with where we're at. Uh, the needs of our workforce don't support that. Um, I think the future of our, of our country is stronger if we go in another direction. Uh, so my hope is that we can get comprehensive immigration reform passed. Evan, let, yes, let me and, and as, as Mr. Cruz gets ready to say one more word about this, if there are questions, we're going to have you line up at the microphones. Go ahead and start doing that now so we can get right to them when Mr. Cruz is finished. Sir. Let, let me make a point about yeah. what the president did yeah. in, in terms of acting unilaterally, uh, which I think should trouble Mayor Castro, should trouble Democrats, uh, because a year ago, President Obama said he had no constitutional authority to effectively grant amnesty to some 800,000 people who are here illegally. And then, as we got closer to an election year, as we got closer to November, magically he asserted that constitutional authority. Now, I'll tell you. Shocked to discover politics right. shows up in an election year, right? I, I, shocked, indeed shocked. Indeed shocked. Um, but I'll tell you my view. I am concerned by unchecked power in the hands of the executive, whether that executive is a Democrat or a Republican. I think our nation's history, the Constitution was designed to limit unchecked power. And if President Obama is right that he has the power to say, doesn't matter what our federal immigration laws are, I'm going to ignore those laws. And it's not simply prosecutorial discretion. He's had, having people register and saying, once you register, you are here effectively illegally. We will prevent deportation proceedings against you. That is essentially erasing a law from the book. And if a president can do that, I would be curious uh, what Mayor Castro would think of a, of a Republican president that began erasing laws from the book. Something like the Clean Air Act. I thought we just went through that a couple years back. Well, you know, you know it is interesting. Let, let's, let's actually talk about that. Let, let's talk about a very specific instance. The biggest case of my tenure as Solicitor General was a case called Medellin versus Texas. A tragic crime in Houston. Two teenage girls were horribly murdered. The World Court, the judicial arm of the United Nations, issued an order to the country to reopen the convictions of 51 murderers. 
And the president, who happened to be a Republican, George W. Bush, signed an order that attempted to order the state courts to obey the world court. And as Solicitor General, working for Greg Abbott on the behalf of the state of Texas, I went before the Supreme Court and argued the president doesn't have the authority to unilaterally ignore the law. And in fact, I used this exact same example. I said, listen, George W. Bush is a Republican. He's a Texan. I worked for him. I admire him in many respects. But I don't, I fear unchecked executive authority. Regardless, and the Supreme, regardless of party. Regardless of party. And the Supreme right. Court agreed and struck down his assertion of party. Now, what I don't see is any voices, even a single voice in the Democratic Party, raising the question of why is it that the president has the authority to ignore the law? And that's a dangerous precedent. And if, if President Obama supports the DREAM Act or anything else, he can push legislation through. He can have it considered. You know, in, in San Antonio, with, with the tax increase for increasing preschool, you didn't dictate as mayor to do that. You said bring it to the people, go through the democratic process. I think that's the way change should be done, not through executive assertions of authority. Well, but let me just say that we've assumed already that through prosecutorial discretion, what he said is that we're going to prioritize certain cases. He didn't say we're writing off the books all of these other immigration cases, right? So again, what we're doing, what, what you're doing is projecting into the future a result, just like with health care, that hasn't happened yet. That's not what he said. Prosecutorial discretion exists, as you know, better than I do. I, I grant you, you're a much better lawyer than I am. Uh, as you know, prosecutorial discretion exists in every single county courthouse all the way up to the highest levels of our government. It's nothing new. He's not breaking new ground. He's not writing off these other immigration cases. He's saying that we're going to prioritize folks who have committed felonies, who are real criminals, because that's how we believe that with the resources that we have to spend, that we're going to keep our, our, our states safest. You know, we want communities to be safe, and so what we're going to do is start with the folks who are criminals. Yeah. Well, he did a little more than that. He said, we will not prosecute these people. It wasn't just we're going to focus a lot of attention on others. He said, well, this again, is a whole get category of people who have violated federal law, and again, that, that we will refuse to process. Immigration wouldn't take five minutes. <laughs> well, and, and, and again, let me just say, and again, he didn't write those cases off. What he said is for these two years, while, as you say, and President Obama has made this very clear, while Congress has the opportunity, we hope, to do something about this, to step in and change the landscape of the law, we're going to have this two-year pause. He didn't say that, that we're going to write these folks off the books, that they can go on and do whatever they want. This is a temporary status. Let me let me go